Hello, knitting friends. Welcome, welcome. Happy Mother's Day to all of the mothers and anyone who has ever done anything motherly. Welcome. I'm so glad that you took some time tonight to join me as we talk about Never Knitting, my favorite knitting book. Okay, so I need to apologize for last week. Um, I was not feeling well, and that doesn't happen very often. I had to take a nap, and that happens like once every three years, and so I was, <laughs> was really not doing well. Um, so sorry about last week, but I'm really glad to be here this week. And um, I forgot to mention, I'm Kelly, uh, Kelly Vaughn from Knit Swag, and every Sunday night I come here 6 p.m. and I talk about number knitting. This is the original modular knitting book. All of the other modular knitting books that followed are built on the um, foundation of this one. And I've got some, some great stuff to share with you today. Some other modular knitting books I found out about, as well as some archival research I've been doing. So I've got two, two weeks worth of information. Uh, I had to kind of glean some things out and um, I guess winnow some things out. Anyway, I had to streamline some things because I have I have so much to share with you. I've been learning a lot. So welcome, welcome. If you're new here, please do introduce yourself down in the chat. Uh, we have a pretty regular group, but we love to have new people come and, and learn about modular knitting and learn about Virginia with us. We love her. And um, yeah, so I'm glad that you're here. All right. So I've been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about about Virginia's correspondence course, and I've been I've been kind of trying to like figure out where in the timeline that occurred. And so, if you um, are new here, you might not be familiar with this. But I have been I have been on the hunt for a number of months now for vintage McCall's needlework magazines, and the reason for this is because. Virginia mentioned several times in her her knitting book that um, she published some um, some patterns in here, and she worked with the editor Elizabeth um, Elizabeth Blondell, I believe. And so she she mentions McCall's needlework as being like kind of foundational in getting this book ready. The the editor. Um, Elizabeth had encouraged her to get a patent for her work, which she did. She was granted the patent in 48, I believe, and then to publish the book. And so um, the editor of McCall's Needlework is very, very instrumental. Hey, Anita, um, in, in Virginia's progression. And so I've, um, I've been collecting these magazines to try to find out what all was um, what all was happening and so let me show you what i found recently there are a total of there's a total of not one not two but three three number knitting pamphlets and up until last week i thought there was only two. Oh, i was so excited when i found this third one so it's awesome let me show you um let me show you some of them this is the second one this is mccall's needlework 1946 and this is pamphlet number two and I have been able to track down a copy of pamphlet number one it was in a library in Chicago I think and hey Nishibi welcome um, and they I was able with much effort to get them to send me a scan of it and that's awesome and that was pamphlet number pamphlet number one this is pamphlet well this is this is like an article about pamphlet number two and it's got the five-star admiral afghan it's got this cute little scarf um, and it's mentioned in a few different places in this um, this magazine it's got um, Hampton cardigan we're doing the Hampton uh, vest knit along right now this is the the cardigan version it's got the mulberry bush blanket which is in the book and then uh, it's also mentioned again here in the back it's got like this um, butterfly stole so it's mentioned three times in here now what's interesting is there isn't any 
instructions in here. This is like purely a, a multi-page marketing article, which is brilliant. And apparently thousands of people wrote in to try to buy this pamphlet, which is, which is great. Um, if there was thousands for one pamphlet, I would imagine there was there'd be thousands for um, the other pamphlets as, as well. But so far, um, we're not able to get, <laughs> I don't know if we'll ever find any copies of them, but we have pictures. Okay, so the next thing I found was leaflet number three. Now my um, my copies, I I got a I got a steal of a deal on on eBay. This was like I don't know eight eight McCall's magazines, and it said they were damaged and missing covers, but it was like twenty bucks. <laughs> and so I was like, yes, <laughs> I'll take it. Um, and so here it here is what I found this week. Dun da da da. Never before seen, ooh, this, I, <laughs> I was cheering out loud when I saw this. Okay, so this is pamphlet number three, third presentation, easy going, fun to do, copyright 1946. You've got this star kind of a blanket thing here that is, um, oh, happy birthday, Mishi B, and happy Mother's Day. Big day for you, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, and then you've got a little pot holder, or like it's a, what is this? It's like a, like a placemat. And then you've got a, um, some hats and booties and this little, like, I think they called it a bed jacket. That was, that was a pretty common garment back in the day. And then I think it also continues um, over here. There's a, a, there's a little bit. Okay, so this is pamphlet. This is pamphlet number three. Pamphlet number three was published in 4647. So why do I say all that is because I'm the, the book, number knitting book, this was published in 52. Her patent was granted, she applied for it in I think 40, 45, got it in 48, book was published in 52, and the book was based on a correspondence course. And so I've been trying to figure out when that correspondence course took place. So it was after these number knitting articles and before the book was published. So sometimes between 46 and like 19, probably 51 is when she did her correspondence course. <laughs> so that's exciting. I was, um, I was talking with Karen recently, and Karen is, is my archival historian, member of the number knitting team, and she helped me um, go into the web archives and look up Virginia Woods Bellamy like in all the data. And so um, I have a link to that. I don't know if it's in this week's show notes or last week's show notes, but there's like tons of stuff, dozens of places on the web archives where she's mentioned. And they're in magazines, they're in newspapers, they're in, um, not McCall's, none of the McCall's stuff is listed in there, but like all the, the periodical type of magazines. She was in there like a lot, or it, I don't know, maybe not a lot, probably like, eight times, eight to ten times. And so I found one of those, um, I, w I went and I downloaded all of them, <laughs> all of them, all that, that I could find. And um, I wanted to, you know, save them all for archival purposes for myself in like one place. And so here's what I found. This is in, um, let me make this a little bit bigger. This is in a magazine called Craft Horizons, summer 1950. And you'll probably, this is the same little screen grab that I had as like the cover to the video. Virginia Bellamy offers a correspondence course in geometric number knitting, right for booklet. And it gives her address, which is simply a road, River Road, Elliott, Maine. <laughs> and I was like, well, how, how in the world, how in the world is it like you, you can't deliver mail like that nowadays. Like you have to have, like it'll get rejected. You have to have the house number. You have to have the street name. You have to have the city state and the zip code, preferably the zip plus four, right? And so this didn't have, it was just, it just listed her street name. And I was like, what? What in the world? And so that got me down this whole like rabbit trail, like, how did they know where to deliver her mail if it's just the street name? And so I was researching. 
I was researching where, um, like when did zip codes come into existence? I mean, they've always been in existence in my life and I thought like they were just kind of always there, um, but they weren't and they were, they're surprisingly young. So in my research, and I have links to these things in the, um, the show notes down below, the zip code wasn't even, it wasn't in, introduced until um, 1963 is when it was rolled out. And I was thinking, okay, so like all of my grandparents growing up years into their children, like, you know, child rearing years, even until my parents, because my parents were born in 49 and 50, most of their young years, they didn't have zip codes. And that, the, the thought of that just kind of like, it was odd for me. My, my grandpa lived in the same house. He bought it in 1960 and he lived there till he died. And which was like over 60 years he lived in that house. And he had to walk up, um, a, he had like a little mailbox thing on his front, like by his front door. And so the, like not even the, you know, the box on the street, it was on the front door. So the mailman, and it was like that on every house on his street, the mailman had to get out of his truck at every single house and like walk up to the front door to put the mail in the mailbox. And so I, I just, I was, um, I was astonished at that. And so that was what Virginia's mailman must have had to do to like, cause she talks in her, in her book about the, the absolute deluge of letters that she got. Thousands of people were mailing her so much so that she had to hire a secretary <laughs> and her poor mailman was probably like dropping off, you know, big bags of mail for her. And she lived out in the middle of nowhere. And I actually looked it up on Google and there's on her street, Elliott Road, or no, River Road in Elliott, Maine. There's, um, there's some new houses like, you know, new as in like, you know, from the seventies and up, but there's some houses in, on that street that were built in like the 1870s and there's still people living there. And it's like out in the sticks. And so it makes it makes sense that her that her mailman would have to like physically drop off bags of mail on her front her front doorstep. Um, so I also I also found a whole article all about the <laughs> this wasn't geeky enough for you all about the history of mailboxes. <laughs> in case in case you want to go down the uh, the the rabbit hole with me. So it this is all about mailboxes and like collecting mail and now you have to have the flag right um and so all of that had to come it was like phased out in iterations or phased in phased in in iterations like as the need developed over over the years um which is wild there's a couple other mailbox mail types of links down in the, um, the description, one of them is called Bumpy Start for Rural Mail in the Early Days. Um, and all of these are, are really fascinating reads if, you know, oh, hey, where'd my article go? Yeah, um, it talks about like how much people made, how much the mailman made and, um, you know, what the cost of letters were, stamps, and it used to be this is crazy. It used to be that um, within your city limit, the stamps, like there was no stamps required. Mail service was just like free. <laughs> if you can imagine that today. Um, and the whole, the whole idea of um, mail service and mail delivery, it's really, it's changed a lot over the years. And one of the things that really, that really struck me was I think they had to start doing, I think they had to start charging for postage because kind of right around the turn of the century, maybe in the 1800s, I forget the exact dates, they, um, the, the mail order catalog started really becoming a thing. And so um, the, like, like this, I would consider, this isn't a catalog, but you know, it's like a mail order periodical, it's big, it's heavy. You can't like send out a million of these for free. Um, and so like Montgomery Wards and Sears catalog, you know, they would mail out tons of these things and they had to charge for that. And so the, um, the charging for, for postage, it like, it coincided with the whole mail order 
catalog um, period of our country. Okay, so the last thing, hey Bob, um, more S, I'm the same age of your grandparents. Oh wow, very nice. Yeah, so grandpa, my grandpa was born in 2025. 20, he passed away just a couple years ago. He was like 97. Um, grandma was born in I think like 27, like all four of my grandparents were born between like 1925 and 1928 and all of them lived into their 90s, which is, wow. <laughs> Shout out to them, they're awesome. I wish they were still here, I miss them. Um, okay, so mailman. Um, why, like why am I so stuck on this whole mail idea? One, one of the reasons is because, um, let me see, where, where is it in the book? And this is, this is wild. I love this. You know, Virginia, she, she talked a lot about her friends and the people that she knitted, um, that knitted samples for her and the people that let her, like her models. And um, she just, she talked about all the people that were involved with this, her patent attorney, the magazine editor, the, um, the, the people who knitted her garments, her kids, her models, like all of it. You know who she mentions? She mentions her mailman. <laughs> And I was, I was thinking like, I don't even know my mailman's name. Like, why would you mention your mailman? So this is talking about, um, this is on page, this is on page uh, 11 in the book. And she's talking about when she got her patent, uh, three years after she applied for it. Three years later, after a move from New York to Maine, I think that's because she got divorced. I'm not entirely sure, pretty sure though. Uh, the seal of patent t was handed to me by Mr. Maynard Douglas, mail carrier of Elliot, who shook a blizzard off his shoulders as he delivered the envelope from Washington. <laughs> so she, she, knew his, she knew her mailman because he probably for several years at this point had been delivering like sacks and sacks of mail to her house, but also um, it was a really small town. And so much, so much so that, uh, let me see if I can find this other section in the book. Let's see. Because uh, she, she was a friend. <laughs> she was friends with the mailman's wife. <laughs> oh, um, let's see. Mr. Maynard Douglas. Because he's mentioned again in the book. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh, Douglas. Almost there. Here we go. All right. So I've overlooked this picture for quite a while. So you got these two quilts here. And I'm like, why are there pictures of quilts in a knitting book? Like, so I just ignored it for a long time. Um, and I think it's important to not ignore this. These are examples of a couple of different ways that you can do a log cabin design, which incidentally isn't actually, like there's no log cabin design knitted and shown in the book. There's just the chart. But then she has a couple of different ways that you can arrange your knitted log cabin squares in these designs. Okay, so where does the mailman come in? This one, quilt A, log cabin design, owned by Mrs. Maynard F. Douglas, Elliot Maine. <laughs> so this quilt belonged to the mailman's wife, who she was friends with. Um, and she also, in one of the magazine articles, mentioned the different people that she had been, that she had taught how to knit, and the wife of the mailman was one of the people that she taught how to number knit. And I just <laughs> love that. I, I love I love all of that because she's so she's so detail oriented and she gives us like these little little breadcrumbs about like little peaks into her life uh, in in rural Maine in the 1940s just tremendous. Um, bye, Mishi B. Thanks for coming. Okay, so that's. The story of the mailman. Please do take some time and read those wild articles about U.S. postal delivery and like they go into the development of the U.S. Postal Service and the Pony Express and like 
it's it's wild. I spent an hour one day just reading about about mail service, and I know that I gripe. At least I did last time. I was like, the mail service lost my package, and I'm so mad. Like ship FedEx, <laughs> right? <laughs> but like the whole history of the United States Postal Service, it's really interesting. I mean, they're not as efficient or maybe as well organized nowadays as FedEx is. And inter in interestingly, I don't think that they've ever been profitable in like the 150 years they've been in business. They've <laughs> been losing money since the beginning. <laughs> oh. oh my gosh. Okay, so that's zip codes and uh, and and Virginia's mail delivery service and I all of that got started because I wanted to find out how she how she did it and when she did her correspondence course and so I'm guessing if you're in like 1948 and you see a, a magazine article you can just like write to Virginia on Elliott Road or on River Road in Elliott Maine and they get it to her oh one other thing I forgot to um, I forgot to mention um, this is, where is it? Here we go. This is really great. So this is the, um, this is a walking tour, let's see, of, from the Elliott Historical Society. So eventually, at some point, I'm going to drag my loving husband to Elliott, Maine and go on the walking tour. <laughs> um, it must be a really small town if it's a walking tour. But anyway, so this is the walking tour document. And I, f I found this because I was looking for Maynard uh, Douglas, mailman. And he's in here. And so if you look for, uh, for Douglas, he's item number 19. The farmhouse on the right, 1382 State Road, was once part of the Kennard family lands in Laner, the Maynard Douglas home. And so there's a whole paragraph in here about... Um, his route and the number of houses that he served and his horses. Um, I think that's hysterical. He kept two horses, one which he used in the morning and the other in the afternoon. Pulling the mail wagon, they would trot along and when they came to a box, they would automatically come to a stop. Even years later, this training was still a part of their temp temperament as Douglas Wrightside's father, who later bought one of the Maynard horses, found out when he took them for a ride. Just as they would reach a mailbox, the horse would come to a complete stop. <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay, so that was that was the Virginia's mail service. I still have not been able to track down her um, like the actual correspondence course documents. I don't know if we ever will, but we have the book, and so that's you know I'm I'm pretty happy with that. Bob says my mailman has an 800 kilometer run and stops to have lunch at our place <laughs> as it is the turnaround point to come back to town. Yes, I love that. That's a, that's a really long route. Yeah, in my town growing up for, um, for a long time, I lived in Southern California and there was like this little unincorporated town like kind of on the outskirts of town. I think eventually got annexed in, but it was called Deleuze, D-E-L-U-Z, two words, Deleuze, California. And it had it had the smallest, it was like the Guinness Book of World Records for the smallest post office in the world. And it was like a, like a shack in the woods. And I don't know, it was like five foot square or something. But they actually had a mailman and he would get on his horse every day and, you know, ride the, I don't know, 10 miles into town or whatever. And I think he would do it and like take a nap and the horse would just go. <laughs> and then he would, maybe he didn't do it every day, but however often he did it. And the horse would just take him there and he'd get all the mail and then the horse would come back and the horse just knew where to go and what to do. Um, that seems like a very monotonous, probably peaceful existence, being a rural mailman at the turn of the century. <laughs> okay, so that's mail service. Um, acquisitions. So I, I mentioned uh, a little bit ago that I got, I got the, some new magazines I did. I got several of them. I got the eight pack that were like kind of stained and, um, but they're still awesome, even though, though they're not complete. But let me show you, let me show you this one. Oh my goodness. Okay. This is in mint condition. It's, it's amazing. 
It is a McCall's Needlework Spring Summer 1953. And I've been I've been trying to accumulate all the McCall's Needleworks from like 43 up until the mid 50s. And this is my my most recent acquisition because this kind of this was right after her um, book was published and so I thought there still might be some things in here about about her and sure enough there is but I want to just kind of take you through a little bit about this book because it's it's perfect there aren't any folded pages or nothing it's like like no one had ever used this before it's it's the best one I've ever gotten okay um, so in the front of each magazine, there's um, there's contents, and I mean, you think, of course, there's there's a table of contents, like that that just makes sense. But um, there's a there's a woman I've mentioned her before. Um, she has a website called Something Under the Bed, and she does um, she does like let me see if I can find it real quick a whole listing of all of the uh, McCall's she's got like the world's largest collection of McCall's magazines and and researchers because she's got physical copies of these researchers will contact her and like <laughs> ask for <laughs> scans or, or whatever um, and it this is amazing she's been working on this website like documenting all this stuff for I don't know at least 20 years um, and it's tremendous um, so what's what's interesting is I think that the like let's see, uh, 1953, let me see if I can find that. She might not have a copy of this one. Uh, I'm not sure, 1953, there we go. I think that this, yeah, the table of contents here, I believe is gonna match the table of contents that I have, um, that I have over here. So a lot of the, the information she's probably pulled directly from this, but she went on and expanded it even more, which is, uh, which is amazing. Because whenever there's a number knitting article, it'll actually be listed right here. But if it's just like, a, um, like an advertisement, like there, later on in the book, there's an advertisement for number knitting, uh, but it's, that is not listed in here. So that's why it's, it's important to actually have a physical copy of these and not just rely upon the Something Under the Bed website, which is amazing. Um, yeah. Okay, so some of the, the things that I thought were really noteworthy in here is I've been, I've been trying to figure out like when the different types of yarn became available. Because we know that, that and I don't know the dates any like I don't know the dates. I need to do more research on this. But but Virginia in the book she mentions nylon, she mentions wool, she mentions cotton. She does not mention rayon, dacron, orlon, or blends. Um, so I'm trying to figure out like when those different industrial man-made synthetic fibers were introduced. I know some of them were introduced like in the 1800s, but they didn't become commercially available until like later on so i'm still trying to work out all those all those details but i thought that having having this uh, these magazines and it would give me a good idea of when um, i could find out when they were commercially available and marketed to to women and you know to knitters because most of them were probably um probably women yeah so this is this is interesting because the you can tell that Virginia was very, very much influenced by these magazines, but like kind of the whole, um, maybe they were just running in parallel because she has a whole section in her, um, in her book about a traveling wardrobe. Let me see if I can find it. Luggage. Yeah. So if you look in the, in the book, before you get to any of the the patterns for like women and men's sweaters, she has the the introduction is called costume design for men and women. And in here she discusses how you can you can have number knitted um, garments and how how many of them you can fit 
inside of a suitcase. Um, and she gives tra like traveling wardrobe suggestions. And I think that's, that's so interesting because if you look at, um, if you look at this, it's, this is a, like a contemporary of the number knitting book and it's the same idea like, oh, you need to, <laughs> hand knits are good travelers. So you need to make <laughs> your own hand knits for when you travel. And like, if you think about today's modern day knitting sweaters, they're probably, I mean, I could be wrong, like all the knitting books, the modern knitting books that I've ever read, I haven't ever seen any of them talk about how hand knits are so great for traveling <laughs> while showcasing the latest in luggage, <laughs> right? Yeah, I was, I, and you know, the whole idea of, of travel was like pretty, um, I don't know when commercial air travel really became a thing, but you know, back in the 50s, it was pretty, pretty luxury and it was like up and coming you know, way for people to get around. And so I think that they really wanted to take advantage of that. Okay, so more about this book. Um, there's some great old yarn companies, so many yarn companies. Um, oh, did I hit the wrong camera? I did, sorry. So there's some great old yarn companies listed in here and it's, it's tremendous. I can't wait to get my scanner and start scanning these in because I'm going to make a database of all of these old yarn companies and find out like what kind of yarn they made and if they're still in existence and it's just, it's, <laughs> it's on my list of things to do. Okay, so here's something really wild. You know, knitters like, um, they like c interesting tools and I had talked before about the, the whole idea of, um, knitting needle gauges and how I had an old knitting needle gauge that was like incorrect. <laughs> and then I have the new knitting needle gauge that I got. Um, and this, this knitting needle gauge was actually advertised in this, um, one of these magazines. And it, it, the reason it was marketed as improved is because it also had, in addition to the US needle sizes, it also was advertised in the magazine as having the millimeter sizes listed on the um, the knitting the knitting needle gauge, and apparently that was like that was a new thing. And I checked my old vintage knitting needle gauge, and it did not have the millimeters listed. So that was a, an innovation that came about during this time as well. Okay, but check out those knitting needles. These are wild. <laughs> so we're supposed to do gauge swatches, right? And as we know from your own mistakes, probably my mistakes. You're supposed to knit your knit a couple of different gauge swatches on a couple of different sizes of needles, and then um, wash them. Maybe steam press them really gently, block them of some sort. You know, you're supposed to do like a like a gauge swatch. <laughs> but look at these. <laughs> According to this, you don't have to do that. You just leave it on your needles because there's these one inch, two inch, three inch. <laughs> marks right on your needles and so um, it's got the it's got the tapered measure knits measure knits are is like the name of the the knitting needle and it's got the ruler built right in <laughs> I love that so even back in the day knitting knitters loved uh, loved their tech which is which is fabulous okay it looks to me like my video is running a little bit behind. Um, anyway, let me know if you have, or if you're seeing any problems with, with the feed, if it's slow or whatever. I'm just going to keep, keep on going. Okay. So let's talk about, let's talk about knitting books. So in one of the magazine articles that that I found where Virginia was being interviewed by some reporter. She mentioned, this was after her number knitting book was published. She mentioned that she was talking to a publisher in Boston about another knitting book, all about counterpanes. And I was like, hold on now, is there a second Virginia book? No, <laughs> but I thought counterpanes, let's, it turns out that's like an old word for squares. And uh, anyway, so 
that book never came to be. But what is interesting is I found in, in a number of these old, these old um, McCall's magazines, there's these advertisements for knitting books. And it's a little, it might be a little hard to see, but they're advertised over and over and over again. I've seen them probably at least three or four magazines, and I haven't even been really looking for them. They just, they were repeatedly advertised. And I'm going to read you some of the, um, the titles. It's a little small on your screen. For a couple of them, they're listed on Amazon, and I put links down below. I don't think you can get them online because they're like, you know, out of print. Maybe you could find them like in an interlibrary loan. But here's a few of them. Wild West Sweaters for Young Cowboys and Cowgirls by Gretchen Baum. She was very prolific. Jolly Time Sweaters for Children by Gretchen Baum. Playtime Sweaters for Children by Gretchen Baum. Snowtime Sweaters. And then, this is interesting to me, Scandinavian Snow Sets by Kajsa Lindquist. She also did Scandinavian mittens and Scandinavian sweaters. And this was in 1950, 1953. Okay, a little sidebar here. I know that Elizabeth Zimmerman also was publishing Scandinavian um, patterns in the 50s. I don't know at what point, but I, I'm curious to see like where this, this Scandinavian um, sweater where these sweater books fit in with Elizabeth Zimmerman's timeline. So that's a, that's a whole nother rabbit trail I need to go down. Okay, so if you, um, you know, you keep looking and there's like, I don't know, a dozen or so of these books. And then I looked down at who published this. Who published this? This was a company called Plays Inc. in Boston, Massachusetts, which is the place that Virginia had told a reporter she was talking to a publisher about doing a knitting book. And so I can't help but wonder if Virginia was talking with this publishing company about doing a book on counterpanes. That's what I think. Because in, in all of the other the all of the other magazines that I've been looking through, there's not generally knitting books advertised. There's like knitting pamphlets maybe and there's books about about other other stuff um, but not really just strictly knitting books and that company uh, plays ink they they advertise is always in the sidebar they advertises advertise knitting books specifically the ones for kids and the Scandinavian ones and then Virginia was talking with a company in Boston about counterpanes so it never came to be, but I thought it was it was a um, a worthwhile a worthwhile endeavor to try to look for it. I tried to track down the Plays Inc. publishing company, and I was able to find something on like Open Open Books or Goodreads or something. But it's like about I don't know Elizabethan costumery for the like Shakespearean plays or something. It has nothing to do with knitting. Um, so I, I'm thinking those books are probably that publishing house is lost to history. But I, you know, I might be, I might be mistaken, and I'll stumble across it one day. Not stumble because I'd be digging for it like I do. All right. So that is my latest find and the research I've done on Virginia's correspondence course and her her mailman <laughs> and her book. Mm. Okay, so I did want to talk a little bit more about, let's see, here we go. This is the number, the number knitting article. This is pamphlet number three. Of course, I took my bookmark out. Um, but in here is the, let's put this back. This is pamphlet number three. There we go. Pamphlet number three, which is which is great. It's got uh, one, two, 
three, four, five, six, maybe seven or eight things in there. This little baby set looks very similar to um, very similar to this. And so it could it could be the same thing. I'm not I'm not entirely sure. It looks similar. So yeah, maybe so. Not the hat, but the little sweater does. And the this one also had it had baby like baby panties that went with it and like a little baby shirt thing that kind of like tied at the at the corners. And that kind of looks like what's going on here. So we might have these patterns. I'm not sure. But anyway, the rest of this, we could probably recreate. Um, this looks like kind of a square. We could probably do the, the jacket too. We can make all this, even if we don't have the, um, the charts. We can chart it. That's fine. And this is, it. in this one, it, this little bed jacket, it talks about, um, you can see the shaping of it here. This whole idea is that it's um, it's this it's like three point font, and so it's a little hard to see. But like this this um, pamphlet number three was where she introduced the idea of a of a wing, a single wing and a double wing. And her other her other patterns they weren't they didn't list those. So and I think even in this this article it talks about how. Um, yeah, here it is. In this issue, we are introducing some lovely designs based on a new unit called the wing or parallelogram. If you look at the baby afghan, you will see the double wing unit in the center. Four double wing units make the lovely star done entirely of pink. After this is knitted, the rest of the afghan is knitted to the pink center with white wool. And um, Notice the wing motif in the cap with its cute little wing trim. Oh, that is cute. On the top. Aren't the mitts adorable? <laughs> yes, <laughs> they are. Um, oh, this is interesting. The panties button at the sides for convenience in adjusting the diapers. So that must be a different pattern than this because this does not adjust. Like this just has ribbing. This doesn't have like any little side things. And it mentions in here how, I mean, you can see the, the this is like a triangle here. This is a double wing for the, the shoulder and then it's filled in with a, a white divided triangle. And it does talk, um, it talk, talks about that somewhere in here. So one of the things that really got me going on a, uh, um, a chase this week. So down here, it's talking about the cape and how it's, you know, sweaters and placemats, all of that. Enchanting evening wrap. Okay. And then it says, Carlin Comfort from Saks Fifth Avenue. And I was like, what the... What the heck is Carlin Comfort like? Is that a, is that a yarn? Is that a yarn company? Because that seems like I could see that being a yarn company. It's like it's comfortable. Like, so I started researching Carlin Comfort yarn and like you know all the Red Heart fluffy fluffy <laughs> yarn and line brand started showing up and I was like you know it's all synthetic and I was like and modern. Like, no, that's not it. Like, what is what is Carlin Comfort? And I kept finding like bedspreads. I was like, what? What does that have to do with number knitting? Like, I don't, I don't understand. Like, what is Carlin Comfort and what is Saks Fifth Avenue? It's like, is she saying that it was Carlin Comfort brand that she bought from Saks? Like, Virginia wouldn't do that. No, because she, she looks, she had in the book a whole section on, um, let's see, it was, it was called Chicken Feather Yarn. Chicken, yeah, Chicken Feather. Let me show you this. This is hysterical. She was she was so funny. So she she didn't like it that the yarn companies were the one that that published the patterns, and they said you have to use our yarn, and we can't 
we can't be liable if the results don't come out if you don't use our yarn and so she wrote like paragraphs about it um, the yarn manufacturer is naturally interested in the sale of yarn yet the manufacturer of knitting yarns is the only one who serves what is left of the craft of knitting it is he who manufactures the medium used by the craftsman the knitter and stamps the design with chicken feather yarns are the best yarns use chicken feather yarns when you are knitting chicken feather designs she she was totally like she was kind of mocking mocking the you know the yarn companies for her era which i find i find really funny so so back to carl and comfort like if she she wanted people to like first of all she had raised kids through the depression and she knew like how poor everybody was and and like wanted people to be thrifty and that was like one of the big the big selling points of her book I think it's even here on the cover. A simple to learn method that is easier, faster, and cheaper than ordinary knitting. Okay, so a woman who advertises that is not gonna be advocating that you buy your yarn at Saks Fifth Avenue, <laughs> right? Okay, so, <laughs> so what the heck is Carl and Comfort? After, after some digging, let me see if I can find this. After a bit of digging, I found it. And uh, of course, now it's, now it's missing. I'm gonna find it real quick. Carlin Comfort. There it is. All right. Carlin Comfort is the comforter. <laughs> Apparently, Carlin Comfort was, that was like the Saks Fifth Avenue, like that was their private brand label for this specific type of comforter. And so if, if someone said, I have a Carlin Comfort, they would be talking about that specific type of comforter and it was only available at Saks. And so like, why was this in the number knitting book? <laughs> Crazy, huh? Okay. So we go back over here. The reason that Carlin Comfort is mentioned in this is because this woman here is sitting on a chair and it's got a Carlin Comfort on it. It's, it's got one of these fancy satin comforters. And according to uh, this Etsy advertisement, it, there's no like fiber content listed, but it, it it says vintage from the 1950s, uh, rare vintage Carlin Comfort, Saks Fifth Avenue. So <laughs> Carlin Comfort has nothing to do with knitting, but apparently, I don't know if maybe Saks paid them, but they, they thought it was noteworthy to mention who made the comforter. <laughs> anyway, that took me like an hour. <laughs> Oh gosh, good times, good times. <laughs> I'm having, I'm having so. Oh hey Stephanie, um, thank you, thank you for the. Oh, I always, I always pat my microphone. I'm sorry if I, you know, if you get all kinds of noise when I do that. Okay, so the shirt. This is, this is diamond. No, this is a Hampton. I think this is a Hampton sweater. Let me see if I can find it. Um, Hampton. I think it's Hampton shirt adapted for women. Yeah. Okay, here it is. This is Hampton shirt adapted for women. And this one, I think she mentions it's in nylon and it's got a short sleeve. And so Mine is in wool, and it's also got the short sleeve. And this is fun. Um, this was like a color changing yarn that was supposed to be like green to purple to green to purple, like different different kinds of transitions. But I was like, I don't want, no. Like I want it like all green and then all purple. And so what I did, I, I like unwound the ball and I ain it up and then over the top and so the back is all green and the front is like is is purple it all it, it fades so yeah that's Hampton Hampton shirt 
Um, okay. <laughs> oh, all right. So, as you know, I love books. Love books. <laughs> in case you couldn't tell. So when I was I was researching in the history archives all the books, all the places that Virginia is mentioned, and there are a couple dozen at least. There's a bunch of knitting books that are mentioned where like principles of knitting she's mentioned and um, you know a number of different modular knitting books but there's one specifically today that I wanted to talk about and I don't have a physical copy and I, d I don't hadn't even got one checked out from the library yet to like show you the hard copy but I found something that's pretty great about it. So the book that I want to talk about today um, is let me see if I can uh, yeah here it is okay so this is called a knitter's gallery of mitered squares it's paperback June 2013 it's by um, who is this by it was someone that I wasn't familiar with a woman who wrote it with her mom. Oh, Jill Bigelow Sutto and Jane Bigelow, Volume 1. And it looks pretty... Can I zoom in? And it doesn't, it doesn't do it justice. It looks pretty unassuming. And i probably seen it before and just overlooked it. Um, but I... Well, hold on. Ah, all right, let me fix that. Um, it looks pretty unassuming, but it's um, it's worthwhile to to look at because you know I like to I like to you know I love garter stitch like of course we all love garter stitch and I like modular knitting and every modular knitting designer is going to have their own style. Virginia liked one color just plain garter stitch. Now, if you have, um, I don't know if I have it here. No, I don't. Vivian Hawksborough, she's got more of like a Scandinavian style. Hers is garter stitch, but she does like a lot of stripes, which is great. Different style. Virginia uses like a whole bunch of different shapes. Vir uh, Vivian tends to use more like just the mitered square, and which is also great. Um, so she uses more color. But what's really interesting, um, Oh, I zoomed in on my computer screen and now I can't figure out how to zoom out. Oh dear. Um, all right. So the the this book it uses <laughs> Oh, come on. Zoom out. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna have it. I'm gonna I'm gonna figure it out real quick. Dear. <laughs> um, here we go. I think I figured it out. Okay, so what what she did is she uses charted color work and charted patterns in conjunction with modular squares. I'm going to try to wrap your head around that. Like Virginia's, Virginia's patterns are just garter stitch, but they're charted. They're like, they're schematics sort of. Um, zoom. I got to, I got to figure this, this zoom accessibility. How did I do this? Zoom. Um, Oh, hold on. I'm just going to have to make this work. Okay, so this this book is available, and I have the link. Um, I have the link down in the show notes for this book. So if you go to the archives.org, I thought it was just like you know, old magazines and, and stuff and old newspaper articles or, you know, old stuff. 
But this book was published in 2013. But somehow, like, I don't know what the, the copyright law is, but somehow they've, they've made it so that the web archives can, like, they've scanned in the document and you can borrow it for an, like an hour? For two, you could borrow it for an hour and like flip through the whole thing, which is amazing. And so let's do that. Borrow for one hour. And I did that recently and I was able to flip through the whole thing. Now, I don't know if like, Part of the deal is that the scanning quality is, <laughs> is crummy, because um, it is. It's it's not good, and it's hard it's hard to read. And I'm sure the um, I'm sure the hard copy is much much better. But I just wanted to show you. Um, I wanted to show you this book because she does the same style that Virginia does and that Vivian does, like all of this looks familiar, right? But her shapes, she uses more than just garter stitch. She has like stock in it incorporated, which is fascinating. And, and then, you know, you go forward some more pages and you've got lace work, like <laughs> what the what? And it's all in a mitered square. And then you've got, um, I guess this is, this is uh, like a, it's not, it's like a corrugated rib. It's not a rib, but it's like a corrugated two color work. Um, yeah, and so it uses color and it uses different stitch combinations and lace and it's all charted, not just like in the schematic, because in the early one, it sh I showed the schematic, like, you know, it looked like a pillow or whatever, like you could see how the shapes fit together. But what she does here is the charts are like, I don't know the technical term, they're like the, the dots and the lines and you know they show the different stitch patterns. Um, I don't really do charted like collar work or charted lace work because I don't have that much brain power left at the end of the day. But um, I'm thinking you could take these same designs and like incor the, incorporate them into number knitted garments. So like instead of just a garter stitch, like a Hampton sweater that's made with like garter stitch squares, you could do a Hampton sweater that was made with like these kinds of squares and it would still have that crossway stretch. I mean, <laughs> does this not blow your mind? This is amazing. So if you really want a, a wild knitting challenge, please do check that out. Get yourself a copy of that book, borrow it for, I mean, just borrow it for an hour, flip it through, uh, flip through it and, um, and give it a whirl. And there's a link down below to the book on Amazon and also to that web archive where you can see the, um, you can see the preview of it. And <laughs> it's, it's wild. Whenever I see stuff like that, I'm like, I don't know how to do anything. <laughs> I don't know how to do anything. Like all I could do is garter stitch. I'm just I'm amazed at what um, at what people come up with. Let's see if I can. Oh, I still <laughs> I still don't know how to zoom out. So I'm really sorry if I'm missing anything in the chat because I can't see <laughs> I can't see the bottom of the chat window. So I'm sorry. Okay, that was exciting. All right, so we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about the knit along. I know we've got we've got several of you doing the knit along for Hampton sweater, and I think I'm the only one doing the bodice blouse with the cape scarf, which is fine. So let's talk first about the bodice blouse with cape scarf, and let me bring. Let me bring that up. Um, yeah, I'm going to bring this up on the screen. Bodice blouse. Okay. Here is the original, um, the original chart, which again is terrifying. 
one thing I have found in this is that she specifies a needle size for every part of this except for the borders, which is a pretty good chunk of the sweater. And so I have no idea what size needles to use for the borders. So I'm just going to spitball it um, like I do. Let me show you the new chart. Bodice, blouse. There it is. Okay, this is this is the new chart that's got the the needle sizes, they're color coded, and then the roadmap telling you what size of needles to use for what units. So you start at the low back and then you work um, to the upper back and then the slur or the right sleeve and then you do the the little cuff thing and then you do the little gusset and then the right front and then you move back to the left back low back and then the left upper back and then the left sleeve and that's where I'm at now and of course like I do ran out of yarn because Virginia she she says you know oh you need I don't know eight ounces or whatever and so I buy how much she says and it's like <laughs> never enough so um, I heard that sweater like if a yarn company sells a sweater quantity of yarn it's six skeins right unless it's like plus size I guess and guess how many skeins I'm gonna need for this six <laughs> of course how many do I have three <laughs> Oh dear. All right. That's okay. We're, we're moving on. So I want to show you this, this sweater is so wild. Uh, let's do camera three. All right. Let's get this stuff out of the way. I have, I have so many McCall's magazines. Love it. Okay. So, um, yeah so you start you start here with number with number one and this is on a size six I believe and then you do a size seven for unit number two and then unit number three you do on size 13 needles which after you're you're done with um you know working on six and seven size needles us six and seven and then move to 13 it's like it's uncomfortable. It's really uncomfortable and it's it's awkward and I don't normally like knitting on size 13s. I mean they're they're gigantic. Anyway, so I'm I'm working on the size 13 needles and you have to cast on you pick up like 30 36 and then you cast on 36 and then you <laughs> you cast on another 72. And so it's just, it's huge. It's very blousey. And I showed this off last week. And even though it's, um, even though it's only, it seems long, but I think it's going to be fine because it's supposed to be blousey. Now, question for you guys. Are you having um, any, any issues with the feed? Because it's blinking at me over here. And I want to make sure that that's not, it's not having an issue. If it's having an issue, please, uh, please do tell me. Okay, so I've got, I've got this sleeve here. And what's interesting about this is, I mean, this, this edge here is going to be as long as this. It's going to like 25 inches or something. It's, it's big. Um, but what she has you do is pick up every other, pick up one stitch and every second stitch. And so it makes this whole gather right here, which is, is lovely. And then she has you do, um, so you do like a little cuff, but then she has you do this little rounded section, which I was like, what, what in the world is that rounded section for? And so what I found what I found when I put this thing on my on my wrist is once you secure the cuff and the sleeve, like if I was to sew this all up, this rounded section like covers the top of the hand, 
which I've never seen a modern sweater do before. So I, I went to, a couple weeks ago, I went to Colonial Williamsburg and I got to see all the people in their like 1770s garb and it was, it was fabulous. But one of the things I noticed was that one of the girls who was standing outside in the sun, like, you know, she was a historical interpreter and talking to people. She had these um, linen, like these linen arm cuff things and they came down and they had this big flap that like totally covered up the top of her palm. No, the top of her palm? No, this is the palm. The top of her hand to keep, to keep the, the sun off. It is blinking. Okay, I don't know why. I'm sorry, it's blinking. I don't know why. Maybe I will just try this way for a while and see if it still blinks. Maybe it's the camera setup. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so the the woman at the historical um, wearing the historical garment, she had it like her her sweater, her her um, linen like glove things covered up the top of her hand to keep the sun off. And I thought, well, that's really interesting. I wonder if that's what Virginia was trying to do here with um, with this setup in that it's it's like rounded that's what I'm thinking anyway I love that so in the sweater let me bring my my chart back up in this chart This second section, which for years I didn't even realize that this um, sweater had two charts. <laughs> so I had to make it just for this knit along because I, I missed it. So the second chart is just the borders. And um, it, it, like is, it doesn't have the poofy sleeves. It doesn't have any of that. It's just it's showing you the units, you know, I think this is one, two, and I forget what these other units are, but this is, this is, these are the body units. And so on this chart, you're just going to be knitting these borders. And I was, I was confused last time as to like, why, like this doesn't look like a sweater to me at all. And then it occurred to me, she's showing you what this looks like, both flat and like, um, open and closed and so depending on how you fold it that's kind of what she's what she's illustrating so let me show you what i i mean by that so this this sweater here you've got units one one two and then over here is unit i believe this is unit six and so if pretend this this sleeve is not here right and so you've got these three, these three units. Why is this blinking? Blinking here too. Yeah, I I don't know why it's blinking. I'm. I don't know. I'm gonna have to research that because there's there's a lot about camera setups and feeds and YouTube that I don't know. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> kind of making this up as I go. I will figure it out. So hopefully that won't that won't happen next week. Maybe it's like a like a speed issue. I'm not sure, but I will I will get it figured out for next time. I promise. Okay, so this sweater is um, is like showing you what it looks like both when it's open and then both when it's. Um, kind of closed, if that makes sense. So she's just giving you a couple schematics about what to look for. Uh, also, I noticed that not the borders aren't all numbered. And so they're only, they're only here, they're only numbered once. And so you're gonna knit these borders down here. Um, but I guess these other ones would have already been knit because they are numbered, they are numbered up here is kind of 
um, kind of what I'm, I'm thinking. Anyway, so I'm, I'm on, I'm on unit, I'm on unit nine right now, which is the second sleeve. And this sleeve, this sleeve is, it is ginormous. So that's probably going to take me a good couple of weeks. Um, I thought it wouldn't be a big deal for me to get, to get through like this whole thing by the end of the knit along, which I guess is the end of June. So I, I think I could still do it, but it's, um, this sleeve takes a long time because <laughs> it's a, it's a 72 by 72 square just for the sleeve. So that's 144 stitches at the beginning. So wish me luck. All right, let's talk next about, um, and I do apologize about the blinking. Okay, so the sound works. So it's not the microphone, so. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. Um, okay, so the, the Hampton sweater. I originally was going to make those files just available until May 5th, but I thought, you know, I'll just do it to the whole rest of the knit along because other people might want to join in, you know, as they come along. And so I, I did make those files available. I, I don't know. I'll make them available until the end of June because technically that's when the knitting, the knit along is going to end. Um, so I thought I'd show you what, what I have done so far on my Hampton sweater. So this is, this is Mr. Bear. <laughs> and Years ago, I love him. He's such a good model. I had pups, and when they were, well, I, I, I had pups. I don't have pups anymore. They got old. Um, but years ago, when they were pups, one of them chewed off the left, no, the right arm of Mr. Bear. So he only has one arm now. So he's limb difference. Um, he has a limb difference. <laughs> but anyway, he still makes a great model because he's roughly the size of a baby. And... Um, he can model my garments for me. Okay, so what I did with this, uh, I'll take him out now so I can show you the, the sweater. I did this the same, to the same proportions that, that the um, adult version is. So I did it four squares wide and I did it five rows tall. And for an and then I added ribbing. Now for an adult, I think this is a, a great proportion. However, I know that babies have different proportions, and I'm thinking, I don't know if this is appropriate. Not that it matters now because it's done, and um, <laughs> I'm it's going to a baby shower next weekend. Um, but anyway, all the the. Other sweaters that I've seen, they're like short and they're like really blousey, like almost tense. But this one is like longer and, oh, the, the blinking stopped. Well, that's good. It beats me. I don't, I don't know. Um, so this is like longer and tapered and I wonder if it's too long. Like if it was a little longer, it could be like a sleeping sack, right? But it's, it's not. So it's like this weird, it's like this weird halfway size. And I don't know, I don't know if this is good. And I'd, I don't have kids. I've never had kids. I used to babysit kids. But it's been about, about 30 years since I was around human beings this small. And so... Okay, moms and anyone that's had to ever take care of children. Is this good or not? Like, I mean, I know the bear's not like the same size as a baby. Like, it might have different proportions. But like, would this be annoying that the little feet, like the knees are covered, but like the feet aren't and it's, but it's not a sack. And I just, <laughs> would you like this if this was given to you for a baby? I don't know. I don't know if I got the proportion right. It doesn't matter now, because <laughs> it's done. <laughs> but I just, 
I don't know, I could use some feedback. Okay, so something fun I did on this one is that I was on a, the blinking started. The blinking start when, of course I can't see the blinking stop. The blinking started. All right, the blinking start when you switch to the overhead camera. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe that's the problem. Maybe I'll just, I'll just try it for this way now. Okay. Um, and Maura says a lot of baby sweaters are wider at the bottom to go over the diapers. Okay, see, I did not know that. I did not know that. <laughs> yes, I don't have kids. I don't know. Okay, but would you use this? Like if, if this was for your baby or grandbaby, like even though it's a little tighter at the bottom with the ribbing, would you use that? Should I like, should I take the ribbing out? I don't know. Let, let me know in the comments because I got a week before this is, um, this is going away and so I can make adjustments. Okay, so what I did with this is I was on a road trip and it was going great, but I only brought one size of needles with me. I mean, I used to carry like 30 sizes of needles with me, but like I only had one and it was like a size, it was an eight. And you know, when you do ribbing, you usually do it like two or three sizes smaller so it tucks in, but I wasn't thinking about baby diapers. So I was like, well, I can't, I don't have a size five, but I got an eight. And so what I did, what I did is a um, twisted rib. I did a one by one twisted rib just to kind of tighten it up. And it makes it kind of more like laddery, which I'm not a super big fan of. I don't know if you can see that. I'll, I'll try the overhead camera again. Um, it makes a little bit more laddery, but you know, that's all right. I don't, I don't mind it. I, I probably would prefer it if it was on size fives, but I didn't have size five and I had size eight. So that's what I did. So anyway, this is Baby Hampton and I'm learning so much from your feedback about this. I'm learning how to dress children, <laughs> which apparently I don't know anything about. Okay. Hampton sweater. Okay, so I learned something funny about this. You know that handy dandy knitting calculator thing that I made where you can plug in your own <laughs> you can plug in your own bust measurement and your own gauge and it's supposed to um, calculate for you. Well, I messed up <laughs> when I <laughs> when I did my own calculation. Let's see. There it is. All right. So this is this is the if you go to Knitswag, go on blog, and it's the first one, Hampton shirt sleeveless sweater. Now the pattern in the book, the chart doesn't match the instructions. And so I read you the chart so that um, each one of these squares occupies a single box. So if you try to use this chart calculator with the, the schematic in the book, it won't work. And so what I did is I, um, the yellow fields, you can calculate your measurement. You can change those. So what I did, I'm, I'm a 36. Ah, tab never works. And I was calculating six stitches to the inch. And I don't know, <laughs> I don't know where I went wrong, but my box number is supposed to be 27. <laughs> oh man, 27. What did I make my box number? 16. <laughs> ah, dear. And I think it is six stitches to the inch. Let me double check. I should, I should do a better job of this. One, two, three, four. It's five stitches to the inch. So let's, let's redo the, the calculation. So it's f five stitches to the inch. My box number should be 23, but my box, what I actually did was a box number of 16. <laughs> ah, 
that's all right. I'd rather be too small than too big. <laughs> all right, so let's take a look again and see how big this thing actually is. So 36 inches around should be 18 inches on the front, maybe 17, like if I had a little bit of negative ease. So what is this? This is 14 and a, we'll say 14 and a half. And so times two, that's 20, nine inches and I'm a 36 and so that's going to be a negative ease of eight inches. <laughs> ah! <laughs> okay here's the wild thing. It's a negative ease of eight inches which normally would like you'd be like that's not going to work but ladies I tried this thing on and it looks good. <laughs> It looks really good. It actually stretches. It totally stretches because of the, the all-way stretch fabric. Like, it totally fits. It fits all the way down, and it looks it looks awesome. I mean, it could also fit a 12-year-old, but it fits me. <laughs> it's very adaptable. So, just, it's amazing. Okay, so what else did I do on this, this sweater that I calculated? <laughs> I can't believe I screwed up. I must have been a really tired when I did that math. Oh well. Um, okay, so so this is all six, the box number 16, which, you know, it's wrong, but it is what it is, and I actually don't mind it. In the original pattern, um, it doesn't have any sleeves, but based on Virginia's other patterns that she's done, like the copper cardigan and the diamond design sweater, like, I can, I can make sleeves, that's no problem. And wah, what I'm doing here is these are all 16 by 16, but in in her other sweater pattern, she just has you like gauge shift down. And so if like you're using a seven, like an eight here, then you'd use a seven and a six, and then like the gauge just keeps getting tighter and the fabric gets stiffer, but it's not, it's, it's not tapering the sleeve enough for my preference. And so what I'm doing, um, this is, I think this is a like a, these are eights. This is size eight. This is size seven uh, on a 16 by 16 square. I'm keeping this at a size uh, seven all the way down, but this is a 15 by 15 square. This is a 14 by 14 square, and I'm going to keep progressing down so that the sleeve will have a nice, a nice taper. And it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's tapered much now because it's like the side seams are seamed up. But um, but it will. It's going to have um, it's going to have a nice taper. And interestingly, in in the um, the Vivian Hawksborough book called Domino Knitting, she does her shaping like that too. Like for you know for hats, um, she has you work like a larger number of stitches on your squares at the at the base, and as you get more toward the top, she has you just decrease the number of stitches on your divided square. Um, and so that's what I decided to do this time. Now, we had talked about gussets, and I decided, like, on the copper cardigan I, I did recently, I did, like, the pattern set, and I had a gusset here, and then I had, like, this 12-inch deep armhole, and it just, it looked <laughs> like a tent, just a, a huge tent. But then I've noticed on some of her other designs that what um, Virginia does is she doesn't always use a big gusset she sometimes will use a small gusset. Like on this bodice blouse with cape scarf, it, it does occupy a full square. Um, in this case, that's 12. In my case, it's 12 by 12 stitches. So it's not, it's not huge. If you're doing like a, a garment that where your, your um, mitered square is like, you know, 25 by 20 or 30 by 30 or something. I mean, the, if you did a full, amount of that for a gusset it would just be like this ridiculously huge underarm and so what I've decided to do is I, th I think I'd like a little bit more space here I think it would fit better instead of a, um, a 16 by 16 gusset which would be here and that adds all that extra width to the bust line it's going to take away that nice form-fitting bust line that I like I'm just going to do like a little gusset like a half a half size gusset so it's just going to add like um, an extra inch and a half or so here and I think that's going to be lovely. I haven't decided yet how I'm going to do the um, the bottom if I'm going to rib it or 
if I'm going to do I-cord. I tend to like, kind of a big fan of I-cord at the cuffs. Um, I've done that on some other sweaters and I, I like it. It's a little finicky, but I do like the I-cord cuffs because um, I find like if I'm, if I have it ribbed and I need to like push my sleeve up, I'm always worried that like the, I'm going to stretch the ribbing out because I don't like, I don't like to get my sleeves wet. Like if I'm washing my hands and I want to like shove it up out of the way. And if it's ribbed to stay tight, that's harder. I don't, you know, I don't like ribbing. Um, let's see if there's any more comments. Anyway, I would love to hear about your, your Hampton sweaters. Um, so there's a link in the show notes to the Ravelry group for, for number knitting. And also there's a link to the knit along for this. And um, we're going to do a prize again. I don't know exactly what it is yet. Last time it was one of these uh, secret society mugs. Secret Knit Swag, uh, Virtual Knitting Group, Secret Society for Intellectual Introverts. So Bob won last time and she got one of these mugs. We'll do one of those again and probably something else. But there is a prize for, um, for those who do. There is a prize. Somebody will win. <laughs> it's not for everybody. <laughs> not everyone's getting a mug. But somebody will get a mug and probably something else um, at the end of the Knit Along. Also, if you're, if you're new here, um, and you haven't got a copy of the book, the, um, and I understand, you know, because the book is like, if you can find one on Amazon, it's like $300. Um, I have the ebook for sale in my Knit Swag shop and in my Etsy shop, but also if you are uh, on a fixed income or a budget, and I get that, I've been there, what you do to get a discount, do a knit along with us, post, post it in the Ravelry group, share it with people, and then I'll give you a discount code. Uh, I, what I want is for people to be invested in this project and knitting along with us as a group is a great way to get invested. So um, definitely take advantage of that if you um, don't yet have a copy of the book. But you can also always come here every Sunday night and ask questions. I always, you know, I, I made the PDF of the ebook and I spent a long time doing it and I've redrawn all of the charts, which, which took like two years. Uh, so I'm really familiar with, uh, with all of that. So if you do have questions about any of the sweater patterns in the book, um, come on Sunday night, ask questions, or like go to the Ravelry group and ask questions and I'll like, you know, I'll show you in the book and we can talk about it together. Um, yeah, and I do apologize for, <laughs> I was hoping, like I even told my husband before the show, like, yeah, I'm like feeling comfortable with the YouTube and like I'm getting things figured out. It's like working really <laughs> really great. And he's like, oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> and then the blinking started and I zoomed out on my screen and I don't know how to fix it. So <laughs> I'm learning so much. I'm learning so much. Good grief. There's a comment. Uh, oh, Bob says her, I think, I think it says your mug arrived. I'm glad. <laughs> I can't totally read it on the screen, but I'm glad. I'm glad that it arrived. Um, thanks so much for coming and listening to me talk all about Virginia and her mailman and <laughs> my McCall's magazines that I that I have been collecting and I love so much. Um, this has been super fun for me. And yeah, so I think that's it. It is yeah, it's 7:30 uh, and it's Mother's Day. So if you haven't, um, you know haven't called your, your mom or your mother figure or, you know, haven't had your family serve you uh, ice cream on a silver platter, then do any of those things. And um, I'm really, I'm really, really glad that y'all came to, to hang out with me tonight um, on Mother's Day. That's, that's really special. I used to dread Mother's Day. I hated it. And um, I don't anymore. So, so thanks for that. You're a part of that now. Uh, today's been a great Mother's Day for me, and I hope I hope for you as well. All right, friends, I think that's it for me. Um, so until next time, we're gonna sign off, and I hope that you have a great week. And I look forward to seeing your uh, your number knitting projects in the future. All right, thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs>